Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I'm super happy to have Carl Fields with us today. Hey, Carl. How's it going? Good. Where are you at? Um, right now, I am uh, at Arizona State right now. I'm working remotely. I'm finishing up my uh, PhD and working on uh, postdoc applications, which are as fun as people told me they would be. <laughs> yeah, those are those are exciting and time consuming. Indeed, indeed. Um, that's a very cool background you got there. What is that? Um, I'm not sure the field, but it does have Supernova 1987A uh, back there. It's behind. It's behind my hair. Oh, but there it is. Oh, okay. If you'd shown that, I instantly would recognize it. Okay. I use it to help me stay focused because my cat tends to run behind me in the background. So, ah, it's real life. We we enjoy <laughs> cats in videos. So, um, you know, I've had people come into videos. I've had dogs come into videos. So, uh, the occasional cat is just wonderful. Just wonderful. So, how is uh, how is MSU doing in the pandemic era? Have they have they opened up? Are they actually doing in person courses or uh, MSU? Remote? MSU, yeah, um, I'm not too sure. I think that they switched to online instruction for okay. the remainder of the semester. There was an email that went out today, I think, where they're looking at transitioning to more in-person classes mm -hmm. next semester. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't sound like too many people were happy about that, so I'm not sure how if that'll stick, but yeah. there's been a lot of fluctuation in what's sort of happening, and I think a lot of people are still unsure, so that's kind of my idea of it. Okay, and let's hope things... Uh get better soon there for everybody. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So Carl, what do you like to do for, for research? Yeah, um, so typically I've been working on problems related to stars in different um, areas. Um, I focus in sometimes in nuclear astrophysics, but lately I've been focusing on uh, stellar hydrodynamics mm -hmm. and I've been looking at um, massive stars, so multidimensional simulations of massive stars what that might have, what implications that might have for core collapse supernovae. Mm. Uh, you know, if you can kind of take these 3D models and use them to inform input for core collapse supernova explosions, that might change your answer for what you get in your explosion simulations. And so I've kind of been exploring that lately and seeing what um, avenue that takes us. Cool. And that will lead us to this really lovely and recent APJ paper. September 20th, 2020. Hey, we got lots of 20s in there. On the development of multidimensional progenitor models for core collapse supernovae and Carl, take us away. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm excited to talk about this paper. So this was a project um, that I uh, just finished up and, and had, had published here in AppJ. And um, one of the things that sort of motivated this project was you know, we have, and we've seen the literature, you know, there's been studies of three-dimensional or even two-dimensional simulations of core collapse supernovae. Um, and then in some of these models, they'll explode very energetically. Some of them will fail to explode and lead to different um, mixing instabilities, such as the standing accretion shock instability. Um, and so one of the issues there is that, you know, what's sort of the underlying factor, what's the common factor amongst these models that is sort of inhibiting them from exploding. And so it could be, you know, the inclusion of different treatment for hydrodynamics, um, you know, different neutrino transport treatment. There's been studies against, you know, multidimensional transport versus a, um, a more limited scope in the transport that's it's easier, more computationally efficient. And so one of the things we wanted to do was look at, look at this assumption of the, the input model, so the, the progenitor model. Um, so typically, people will take a 1D spherically symmetric model, they'll map that into their core collapse code, um, and then they'll, they'll explode that, right? So they'll, they'll map this 1D profile into the 3D code and then explode it. So the reason that this might cause an issue is that it lacks any information about the non-radial um, velocity structure and other things that might be um, occurring in the 3D collapse of, of a massive star. And so what we wanted to do was provide that model and look at, um, you know, what are the, some, some of the properties that we can see um, in these 3D models? And so um, we, we were kind of building off previous work from a work in 2015 by um, uh, Sean, Couch, Sean Couch and, and his collaborators 
um, they, they evolved a, three, uh, a 3D simulation of a 15 solar mass star for three minutes. And so this was arguably enough to capture a few um, convective turn turnover times in the silicon shell, but we wanted to extend on that, evolve for longer and kind of simulate and sort of um, extend on these approximations that they had to make. So maybe we can scroll down to um, the first figure and sort of take us into, um, you know, one of the uh, first things that we started with. So uh, right here is kind of a uh, plain vanilla uh, 15 solar mass model where on the X axis, we're showing the mass coordinate for um, the model that we used uh, from the spherically symmetric code Mesa that we mapped into um, the 3D hydro code flash that we used for this work. Okay. Me. And so on the x-axis, we have um, on the bottom density, middle, we have electron fraction, and on the top, we have specific entropy. And so these are pretty typical um, profile structures. And so these are things that you'll see in the literature. This is very um, common for, this is, this is actually quite similar to the model that they used in Couch et al. in 2015. Um, and so this is kind of our starting point. So this model was taken um, from a one-dimensional, di one uh, MESA model that was evolved all the way to about seven minutes before iron core collapse. And so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at this snapshot in 1D, spherically symmetric, and that's sort of the starting point for our 3D simulations. And so that's what we're we're starting with. Um, cool. If you go over to, oh, what go is ahead. The, uh, what is the vertical dash line at around 2.8 or so? Yeah, so that's the um, the edge of our domain. Um, for our computational domain for the 2D and the 3D simulations. Gotcha. And so um, one of the main things we wanted to point out is that we're capturing sort of, um, one, the entirety of the iron core, which if you're unfamiliar with looking at these profiles is typically shown at um, an entropy at value of, of, of four. So it's somewhere around 1.5 solar masses. Right. Um, and so we, 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 we capture the entire iron core uh, and the silicon and oxygen shell regions. And so that's what we're, these are the main regions of interest inside of our models. And you can actually see that further um, if you look at figure two, which is just to the right of there, um, we show the, um, the isotopic abundances, so the mass fractions for these different models. Uh, and our, this is from our 1D model at the time of mapping into flash. And so we can see uh, the innermost region is iron. So it's um, different isotopes of iron itself, um, as well as some, some small traces of nickel. Um, and then the oxygen shell is a green, green region. And then above that, we even include some of the uh, carbon and helium shell regions. Yep. Uh, but yeah, so this is our starting point uh, for the point of mapping over into flash. Okay. Um, let's see. We want to maybe go down to the, uh, the next figure, which I think is figure three. Yeah, so one of the main things that we wanted to do was um, we wanted to compare what MESA predicts would happen with this 1D model to what we see in our models. And so we did that by, before we even mapped into flash, we took you know, this 1D um, model from seven minutes out um, and we plotted quantities that we were going to investigate in uh, 2D and 3D. One of those first quantities that we looked at was something called the Brunt-Fleisler uh, frequency um, and the convective velocity speeds, according to MESA. And so that's what we're showing here on the left is the frequency and on the right is the convective velocity speeds um, from, that, from that seven minutes to collapse. And so the reasons we're interested in this is because there's, there's, um, there's some speculation that there's, you know, the, the approximation for convection in 1D might not be sufficient for what we expect to see in 3D. So now we have these profiles that we see from MESA as they predict them. And then now we can use this sort of qualitatively to look at what are we going to see in our 3D models and does this compare well? Um, and so some key features to point out, um, if we look at the right, uh, so we have X's, we have time axis. On the Y axis, we have the Lagrangian mass coordinate, which shows the, uh, the different, so the um, a smaller value means more interior to the model, further out means outer of the star. Um, so the innermost region, um, so the light up region, I guess is kind of the, the yellowish, is the silicon shell region. It's around um, 1.55 to 1.6 solar masses. And so there's a transition period that happens between the Mesa model where it goes from this very inner region to being a much wider region um, yeah. near collapse. And then the region above that is actually the oxygen shell region, um, which is pretty static in the 1D model. And so this is sort of the basis that we were working with um, for, for our 1D model. And so we map this into flash, we map the 1D profile into flash, um, and then we start our simulations. 
Um, we yeah. we use a lot of uh, we use a lot of the same sort of um, treatments for hydrodynamics and gravity um, as was done in the Couch 2015 paper. But one of the main things that we were able to extend upon that is um, by including updated electron capture rates for a particular reaction onto um, electron capture onto nickel 56. And so this is one important um, update that we implemented into our models that allowed for um, allowed us to alleviate the need to artificially enhance any cooling that was taking place into the into the iron core. This is one of the big criticisms of that work when it was put out is that um, you know due to the short computational time they had to uh, increase this cooling so that the core would collapse within the simulation time. And so that's something that we alleviated within these models. Cool. Yeah, um, so it was good. One of the, so let's go ahead and go to kind of some of the first results that we saw. Um, I think if you go down to like the first 2D slices, um, yeah, this plots down here. So these okay. are, these right here are 2D. Yeah, so one of the first things we did was we started out by looking at 2D models that allowed us to explore the different resolution and as well as sort of, um, you know, compare that to a range of, uh, of settings before extending to the 3D models. And so we have 2D, um, 2D simulations here from, you know, starting from our 1D model, evolving that seven minutes to iron core collapse. Um, and then the top left uh, starts at T equals 200 seconds and the bottom right ends at uh, a time just a few seconds before core collapse. And so the scale here is shown to the magnitude of the velocity. And so a more yellow number or a more yellow region means it's, um, faster moving convective speeds. Okay. Um, and so on the bottom right, um, you'll see that um, some of the main things that we can make out is that uh, if you look closely, the, the innermost sort of uh, shell region is a bit more extended. Um, and so this is the silicon shell region inside of the higher resolution model. And if you compare that to the, um, the left on, on the left hand side, which is the 32 kilometer, so which is this is the this is explaining the highest most refined region, um, sorry, the left in the subplot. Um, so these models differ in, in their finest resolution. So you would expect them, um, if, if uh, models converged, you would expect them to behave similarly. Um, but what we're finding is that uh, in some parts, you know, with, particularly with the silicon shell, we have a more expanded silicon shell region in the higher resolution model. Uh... There's sort of an axis symmetry. You got sort of this bright yellow feature, almost like it was a jet. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that an artifact of the plotting, or is that an artifact of 2D, or what is that? So this thing, right? Yeah. So that's definitely um, um, one of the challenges. Present all of them. Yeah, that's one of the challenges with um, 2D simulations, especially those um, where you have high velocities near the the edge. So you'll have this. Um, issue that occurs with the reflecting boundary condition that will cause, um, that can cause the uh, velocities along the axis to be larger than, than you'd want them to be, larger than you expect them to be in real life. So it is, a, it is a, um, a, an axis artifact. So that's something that we did have to account for uh, in our analysis. And that's something that allowed us to sort of compare the bulk properties of the 2D models, but was something that we had to keep in mind moving forward. Um, in, in general is, is to take it into account. Okay. One of the main things, I guess, for like the 2D models is just, you, you'll notice that the, the flow structure is pretty, uh, it's pretty large scale. It's like large scale plumes in, within this region. And so this is something that's pretty typical of the 2D um, simulations um, due, to its, um, to this, due to this inversion of the energy cascade where you have things will go from, um, smaller scales up to larger scales, whereas in 3D, um, it works the opposite way. And so this is something that we we're sort of expecting to see. So it was reassuring to see this um, and something we sort of were expecting to uh, see in our 2D models, but was something to take, take into account because it inevitably leads to larger uh, velocity speeds. But again, these are sort of the bulk properties that we found from these 2D models. Um, let's see. So I think maybe the best thing to do is to, to kind of move to the 3D the 3D simulations now and kind of see what those look like. Let's see, it's that one, zero omega. Okay. Yeah. So we'll scroll down a bit. 
Okay, so yeah, so this is, um, so we ran two 3D four pi simulations um, and here we're showing the same thing. So the, the velocity, the magnitude of the velocity field um, on the left is a unperturbed model. So that means that we did not initialize the velocity field with any sort of perturbations or anything like that. We just sort of let it develop according to um, whatever the initial um, perturbations at the grid scale level were. And on the right, we initialize velocity perturbations using spherical harmonics um, that were a fraction of the expected velocity speed uh, with the 1D model. And so if you look at the top panel, so the t equals 200 between the two, there's a huge difference, right? So on the left, you'll see that you can very much make out the um, Cartesian grid uh, structure in this initialization of the velocity field. And so this is one thing that we sort of wanted to make sure and, and drive a point home about these new models that are coming out for these 3D massive star models is that it's important that we, one, you initialize the velocity field to be something that you might expect to um, represent, you know, the actual oxygen shell convection when you start these simulations. But also too, um, if you look at the last panel, um, these models sort of converge to the same sort of speeds, right? And so they're reliant on it in terms of the structure. On the left, you might argue that there's a lot more structure that is reminiscent of the Cart Cartesian grid, uh, or excuse me, on the left. Um, but on the right, you have something that's 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 different, but qualitatively they still or quantitatively they still have somewhat similar peak speeds. And so this is something that was interesting to us, cool. and something um, moving forward that was able to sort of um, inform our choices for for these simulations. Nice. Yeah, so um, zooming in, if you want to zoom in on the bottom right one, uh, we have the, so the innermost region is the iron core, so little to no convective velocity. Um, and then outside of that's that thin um, silicon shell region, which is convective. And exterior to that is the entire silicon shell region, which has um, convective velocity speeds that are pretty ranging. Um, and they're also ranging in scale. So you have some large scale flow, but you also have um, some pretty intermediate size um, convective eddies that are occurring. And so these are kind of the main qualitative features that we found uh, with these 3D models. Sure, quite different than what we just saw in the 2D <clears throat> where you had these dominant right. large scale plumes. Right, yeah. And so you see less large scale plumes in that and you also see less um, axis aligned, mm. uh, you know, poles or jets, if you were, right. um, that, were that we saw in the 2D models. Good, good. Yeah, and so um, one of the main uh, key plots that we were able to get out of this is I think the next one. And um, so this plot was uh, made, is the volume rendering of the um, magnitude of the velocity field. So that same quantity that we were looking at in the previous plot. Um, but if we, this time we did we did a vol volume rendering and we wanted to look at you know what is the real structure of the flow like what is what is what does it look like you know in real life as as much as you could um, say that about um, a simulation and so we did that for the uh, the 3D perturbed model so the model on the right um, and we mapped a transfer function where we're showing um, that cyan sort of sphere in the middle is uh, the iron core and so we we want to show the radius of the iron core. Um, and then above that, we have purple. So purple is mapping to a Gaussian peak in terms of the magnitude of the velocity of about 300 kilometers per second. So okay. this would be the, um, the fast moving flow for this model. And um, exterior to that, when you have the war, the more white or a gray flow, that's actually uh, mapped to a value of 100. And so this is a slower moving flow that's um, around the edge of the oxygen shell region um, that we showed in the previous plot. And so. We're seeing very um, a broad range of convective scales in this 3D model. We're seeing um, a range of speeds, and all of these things are uh, things that are sort of um, favorable conditions for um, using them as input for 3D explosion models, you know, core collapse models. Um, these things can indirectly influence the effective neutrino heating rate, um, you know, ex uh, behind the shock, and so these are all very exciting things that we saw. Uh, with our models and sort of took us further than uh, what was done in 2015. So what are the, let me ask, what are the boundary conditions on the outer parts? 
Yeah, so um, so the boundary condition is uh, is a uh, it's a custom boundary condition that's used to damp sort of the velocities at the edge uh, yeah. of the star. And so I will say though that um, in this particular image, we're still within um, the entire domain. Um, there's just a boundary condition for the for the volume rendering itself. Um, and yeah. so the, yeah, so this one, so there's material outside of this that's um, not being shown because it's it's actually moving slower than, than what was shown. But uh, we're this only is about um, I think fifty percent of the domain in width here. Okay. So there's much more to the star than being shown here. Very nice image. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, this is the exciting the exciting part of the star though. <laughs> <laughs> For now. <laughs> yeah. For now. <clears throat> Cool. But yeah, so this is one of the, um, so, you know, I started off by saying, you know, we want to compare this to, uh, you know, what Mesa predicts. And so sort of the, the next qualitative things, you know, we did was, you know, scroll down a bit. I think there's um, some of those same plots of the frequency versus the, yeah, so that top uh, figure 12, uh, the frequency versus the, um, or on the left and on the right, it's a convective velocity. And so we see the same general structure um, but in this model, what we'll find is that um, we see we see some some expansion in our three D models slightly, and then and then further contraction near the collapse. And so this is something that you see when you map um, or when you're when you're doing code three uh, D simulations, hydro simulations, is that it takes a while for this model to sort of reach a sort of a steady state or quasi steady state. And so this is something that we observe in our simulation. Um, but even in, in that situation, we were able to see larger velocities than predicted by MESA mm -hmm. um, in the oxygen shell region and the silicon shell region, um, but also something that sort of qualitatively converged uh, to what MESA predicted. And so in a way, it was reassuring that MESA is doing a decent job in terms of 1D. Um, but in, in, you know, one of the key things that we took away from this was that the actual speeds themselves, however, um, are, were much slower in MESA. Which is something that can have an uh, impact um, if you use 1D models um, in your explosion simulations. So, when you say much slower, is that a factor of two, a factor of 10? A uh, factor of four times slower, I think. Okay. Yeah, okay. is what we found. Yeah, and so um, one of the main things, uh, one of the last few things that we sort of looked at is to try and characterize the. Um, the scales of the convective velocities. Uh, and so the reason this is important is because it's been shown that, um, you know, large scale structure or large scale flows um, can actually be favorable conditions for, um, you know, achieving explosion in 3D simulations. So if you have um, a progenitor model that is sort of tends towards, tends towards large scales or small L, which is being shown here on the X axis, um, and then you'd have something that's more favorable to explode. And so we computed the, um, the power spectrum distribution for um, the oxygen shell, so that outer shell region um, in our slice plots, uh, and the silicon shell, that very thin um, inner shell that's outside the iron core. And we looked at those, and uh, for the silicon shell, we see a broad range of scales um, with a large increase in power towards the end of the simulation. Um, for the oxygen shell, we find something that um, tends towards large scales, uh, towards the end of the simulation, um, but we find a, a characteristic, characteristic um, peak. At, uh, I think it's L, L equals five, or is that three, four? Yeah, four, uh, L equals four. And so, so you see a peak around L equals four, and then you see a peak around um, or an increase in power, I should say, around uh, right. L equals two. And so, this is something that we are excited to see because it means if we have more power in these in these modes, it's something that's uh, favorable for explosion. Okay. Uh, and the dash line at L equal minus five third, that's a coma grow off spectrum. Yeah, yeah. So that's the expected uh, spectrum that we would see for um, a fully, fully developed um, turbulent flow within the sub inertial range, or so, yeah, within the inertial range. And so we can see that we start to get sort of up that um, to that sl expected slope, but we don't quite reach that um, expected slope. Now, I think a lot of that has to do with, um, I mean, so there's a lot of um, reasons, but I think part of it is just sort of this, the simulation time. It's never able to reach a, um, so it reaches a steady state in, in some terms of the, mo um, of the model, but in terms of fully developing turbulence, it's not, um, 
it wasn't able to reach that. Okay. And the L equal minus three is there, is there a physical interpretation of that? Um, so this is a scale that we um, sort of have used to compare to see if, uh, if we can have a scaling above the uh, Kolmogorov scale, scale uh, because there's been simulations that shown that, uh, you know, core collapse uh, simulations that sort of follow these, um, the scaling relation. And so there's not an immediate sort of scaling or physical interpretation with that. It's just sort of seeing if we can compare to other works where, okay, if it's not following the, the expected scale, so we're, what does it go as? Got it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I think that I think the last few plots were just comparing back to Mesa. Um, this is more on the qualitative sides of it. Yeah. I think if you go on to scroll down to, um, yeah, so uh, figure 17, I think, um, or figure, eight, figure 18 works as well. Uh, yeah, so I think I think this is one of kind of the last sort of punch lines that we had here is that if you look at, uh, now we're looking at angle average quantities for all of our 3D models and comparing them back to Mesa. And so the question that we wanted to ask and sort of answer at the same time is, what can Mesa do to help? What can these 1D models do to help in comparing with these 3D simulations? And so um, on the left on figure 18, you see that uh, on the x-axis, we have interior mass coordinate again. On the top, we have convective velocity. And on the bottom, we have uh, the angle average Mach number. Um, so the ratio of uh, the sounds, uh, the velocity to that is the local sound speed. Mm -hmm. And so the pink line is for Mesa. And so if you look at, so this inner first arced curved region um, is the silicon shell. And so Mesa matches pretty well to the green line, which is uh, the 3D octant simulation at higher resolution that we found. And so it's suggesting that Mesa can match very well to this, um, this octet simulation in some cases, but otherwise the speeds were under predicted um, within the, the silicon shell by say a factor of two. Right. But the second um, outer um, region in, in the Mesa model is below all of the 3D models. And so this is in predicting the convective velocity speeds in the oxygen shell region, okay. as well as the, um, the subsequent Mach number. So this was something that we found is that Mesa in this particular situation underpredicted the speeds and the extent of the convective uh, oxygen shell region, which has very large implications for the explodability of the model. So even if you were to um, you know, take these 3D models and map them in, um, that might get you closer to the answer, even if you use the angle average properties, because it was somewhat closer to what the 3D, um, the full 3D simulations are showing. It's also still a, uh... It's still a very subsonic convection. Yeah, so this model is pretty slow, <laughs> which is uh, which is interesting because uh, yeah, so there's there's been a range of um, models that sort of are looking at different Mach numbers. For instance, there's a work by Bernard Muller's group um, where they find a Mach number of about 0.1 in their oxygen shell region, um, which is which is faster, but um, it or closer, you know, higher speeds, but. Uh, there's a wide range of what the expected Mach numbers are within Mesa and now within these 3D models. And so um, I think it's, it's important that we start to get a collection of these 3D models to kind of see what the real landscape looks like um, mm -hmm. and these stellar interiors since they hold, uh, since they have a big role in whether or not the star explodes or if the star doesn't explode, it's a failed supernova, what the sort of fallback and sort of different mixing properties look like. Okay. Cool. So yeah, so I think that was kind of the main, some of the main punchlines uh, from this work. And so we were excited to get that out. Um, all of our data are online, um, but those, I think there's a Zenodo link in the, in the paper. And I, I know that groups are actually actively, um, you know, reaching out and stuff and asking us about our data. So. Very um, good. Very good. Um, so you touched on it a little bit there at the end, uh, but let me just ask, uh, if you look into your your crystal ball, um, so so where does where do we go from here? Uh, where's the where does the um, pre supernova to core collapse community go for the next five years? Um, you know, you hint a little bit about more models. Would this be different masses? Would this be finer spatial resolutions? What? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think that the path forward is to start 
using these models as their as input for for core collapse. Um, I think that they are closer to the right answer. I think they make explosions a bit easier. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I think that the 1D models that most people use, um, there's a handful from 2005, there's some from 2016. Um, I think those are still um, state of the art in some way, but I do think moving forward, I think a collection of more models at different progenitor masses, okay. um, publicly available, available 3D progenitor models that can be used in core collapse simulations, I think is, is the path forward. Cool, cool. I imagine we'll be making some contributions to that. <laughs> forward definitely awesome carl i want to thank you so much for uh spending some time with us today and talking about your your recent apj paper thank you that's all right. right thank you everyone and we will see you on the next one bye bye